kind fate had it, I should be post photographer with the Army during the Indian campaigns close following the annihilation of Custer's command. This Yellowstone Bighorn country was then unpenned of wire and unspoiled by railway, dam, or ditch. Eastman had not yet made the Kodak, but thanks be, there was the old wet plate, the collodion bottle and bath. I made photographs with crude homemade cameras from saddle and in log shack, I saved something. Yes, it was worthwhile, despite the attendant and ungodly smells of the old process. Round about us, the army of buffalo hunters, red men and white, were waging the final war of extermination upon the last great herds of American bison seen upon this continent. Then came the cattleman, the trail boss with his army of cowboys, and the great cattle roundups. Then the army of railroad builders. That, the railway, was the fatal coming. One looked about and said, this is the last West. It was not so. There was no more West after that. It was a dream and a forgetting, a chapter forever closed. Few pioneers left a complete record of their lives, and L.A. Huffman was no exception. His pictures and fragmentary manuscripts recorded bits of the lives of those among whom he lived, but his own personal experiences, for the most part, have been handed down by word of mouth and his quiet modesty, even with his own family, has undoubtedly left many interesting experiences untold. Layton Alton Huffman was born October 31st, 1854, on a frontier farm near Castalia, Iowa. Huffman's desire to push westward in later years came from his heritage, from the tales of adventure told to him by his uncles, sire and grandsires, pioneers all, and from his early surroundings of his several boyhood homes in northeast Iowa, the one he remembered best lay beside the military road, which connected Fort Crawford and Fort Atkinson. Three Indian treaties were negotiated at Fort Crawford. Black Hawk, in the twilight of both his years and fame, had finally been defeated nearby, and the nearby village of Prairie du Chien was a very important fur trading center. Huffman noted later that the many legends of this era were a strong influence on his young mind. In 1865, when Huffman was 11 years old, his father moved the family to Waukon, Iowa, where he opened a photographic studio. Huffman worked various tasks over the next few years, and he didn't mind traveling to do them. He wandered to North Dakota to work on a railroad surveying party, then came back to work in his father's studio, learning the techniques of photography, and then, when he was about 21, he opened a studio of his own in Postville, a nearby village. After three years in Postville, he worked at a photographic studio in Moorhead, Minnesota. Then he wandered to Kansas in 1878. Huffman's stay in Kansas was short, and why he left is not known. At any rate, he soon retraced his steps by the way of St. Paul to Moorhead, and after working on a farm until he had accumulated a few dollars, he then headed for the territory of Montana. With him, he bore a letter of recommendation from Senator William B. Allison, a friend of his father, to Colonel Nelson A. Miles, the commandant at Fort Keogh. There's a story that Huffman had learned while visiting a dealer in photographic supplies in St. Paul, that the post photographer at Fort Keogh had been dismissed, that no successor had been appointed, and that he felt this was his opportunity. One thing is certain, the hope of getting this position led him at the age of 24 to the prairies of Montana. There is no definite record of when Huffman gave up his position at Fort Keogh and moved to Miles City. On February 6, 1880, he wrote to his father, am strongly urged to open a studio at Miles City this coming summer. We'll think about it. And another letter dated a year later indicated that he had moved to Milestown. Over the years, he owned a number of studios, and one of these was an unusual structure. The FY Bachelor was one of the steamboats engaged in carrying buffalo hides down the river in the early 1880s when this business was at its peak. Every hide that could be put on was piled aboard these steamboats. And in order to increase the capacity of this boat, the staterooms back of the pilot house were torn out. 
Huffman bought this salvage lumber and from it built a studio. Another studio of Huffman's burned, and with it, some choice negatives, including the pictures of the evacuation of the Sioux from their prisoner of war camps around Fort Keogh to the Standing Rock Agency. Huffman always spoke of this loss with deep regret, and no doubt, this accounts for some of the gaps in subject matter which become obvious when the collection is studied. Just before reaching Cabin Creek, we struck the Keno Stage Trail a tolerably fair road leading from Bismarck to Fort Keno. There is a line of stages, so-called buckboards in fact, running between these two points, which carry the mail, express matter, and any passengers who have courage enough to risk their scalps in making the trip. They run every day so that Fort Keno, Mile City, and other towns situated from three to five hundred miles west of Bismarck get daily mails when the weather or Indians don't interfere. During the winter, however, the line is frequently impassable for weeks at a time. And at other seasons of the year, much trouble is experienced from the Indians. Since the opening of the line, several drivers and station keepers and a few passengers have been killed and a good deal of stock stolen. When Huffman came to the Plains, Milestown was the metropolis of eastern Montana, and what its lights lacked in numbers and brilliance, its citizens and visitors made up in their colorful conduct and unique business practices. In the frontier years which followed, the village of Glendive acquired a reputation as a rough little cow town. Colson, forerunner of Billings by April 1880, was a tough little town with 16 graves already in Boot Hill Cemetery. It was the saloons, the honky tonks, the variety shows, and the red light district which accounted for much of the business and most, if not all, of the notoriety this Dodge City of the Montana Prairies acquired. Sporting life in Miles City was composed of a mixture of gambling, alcohol, and sex. Some of the business practices were as the stocks of goods offered for sale. Store hours were from early to late. And of course, the saloons never closed. Of all the girls who worked Mile City, the most famous was Calamity Jane. However, in the final analysis, Calamity cannot be classed as typical. To one who observed her when she was an old lady at Deadwood, she was a shabby old lady with nothing romantic about her. She had no sexual morals was a reckless and heavy drinker, and she undoubtedly was a cheerful liar when it came to her own life and exploits. Thus, the development of Mile City was influenced by the people who traded at its stores and patronized its saloons, dance halls, and parlor houses. Eventually, when quieter and more orderly people came to dominate the scene, the irresponsible activities of some of the customers were slowly pinched off. First, the cowboy was required to park his gun on entering town. Then, his time-honored custom of announcing his arrival by riding madly up the street, whooping, and taking an occasional shot at a street light was discouraged. And finally, his coming and going became quiet and orderly. There were old fellows in those trains who had never done anything else but whack bulls all of their lives. They had started in when the Union Pacific was building across the continent just after the war, freighting to points beyond, and when the railroad took their job away, they found it again freighting from rail points into the north. But finally the railroads had beaten them back into this strip of no man's land in the Yellowstone Valley. That the Indian had held supreme control of until a year or two before. Here the faded glory of the bull train was for a time restored, and here it vanished for good and all. Sometime in 1884 or 1885, Huffman changed to a conventional single lens camera using a glass plate six and a half by eight and a half inches, and this equipment he used almost exclusively from this time on. He once remarked that this camera was a homemade affair weighing about 50 pounds. As the camera sometimes got rough use when carried into the field, strength was a necessary requisite. 
It is no wonder that Huffman was proud of his early pitchers. And considering these difficulties, neither is it surprising that he was alert for any changes in procedure which would make his laborious work with wet plates unnecessary. I have seen white men reduced to the last hard tack with only tobacco enough for two smokes and with no immediate prospect of anything better than horse meat straight. A portion of the hard bread was hidden away and the smokes were taken in secret. An Indian, undemoralized by contact with the whites, under similar circumstances would divide down to the last morsels. One of the great tragedies of history, wrote a western rancher, is that the Indian and the white man had to meet. No two races could have understood each other less. Huffman accompanied Commander Miles' little party that negotiated the actual surrender with Spotted Eagle and Rain in the Face after the Indians had moved down from Canada to Rainy Creek. But unfortunately, his impressions, if recorded, have been lost. Even after coming so far, these people were reluctant to give up their horses and guns, so the negotiations could hardly be called a routine affair. Those who surrendered included the San Arcs under Spotted Eagle, part of the Hunk Papa, and various other bands under Broadtail, Kicking Bear, and Rain in the Face. These Commander Miles located in prisoner of war camps along the Yellowstone, just west of the post. Only with the surrender of these parties did the Indian Wars in the Northwest come to a formal end. Huffman's pictures of life around Fort Keogh show the last large camps in the United States where Indians lived in buffalo skin teepees and subsided chiefly on buffalo meat. Among the surrendered Sioux were some interesting personalities. Of these, Spotted Eagle was the most important. Commander Miles described him briefly as a wild, fierce chief and one of the extreme type of wild savage. After the chief surrendered, he made an effort to learn the ways of the white man and adjust himself to their customs. Although not the most important man in the village, by far the best known warrior was a handsome hunk papa who hobbled on crutches, lamed permanently by wounds received in the Battle of the Little Big Horn. A noted warrior among his own people, Rain in the Face's fortitude was attested by the feat of having hung six hours at a Sundance ceremony. Huffman knew and photographed several Sioux and Cheyenne chiefs, but most of his Indian manuscript material pertains to Two Moon, one of his good friends. This friendship dated back to the days of Fort Keogh, when he knew, photographed, and admired the young war chief. On Huffman's part, this friendly feeling arose because he appreciated that savage but genial natural man chiefly, and above all, for the reason that he was Injun all the way through. By the mid-1880s, Indian troubles had simmered down to horse stealing, cattle killing, scares over occasional murder, and incidents which was feared might develop into uprisings. Although the white influence will be noted in most of Huffman's Indian portraits, many of them show the basic items of Indian dress. It must be remembered that many of these pictures show the Indians dressed in what they considered their best for a visit to Fort Keogh or Miles City. Dress was not, however, a haphazard matter, and each tribe had certain characteristics in design and beadwork which were very obvious to another Indian. War bonnets, such as those shown in the portraits of Two Moon, Firewolf, and Rain in the Face, were only worn by important men skilled in the ways of making war. As there are 12 large feathers in the tail of an eagle, of which four were sometimes used, a headdress containing 60 or 70 feathers was a valuable possession. A woman's dress consisted of moccasins, short leggings, a skirt cut to provide freedom of movement of the arms and shoulders, and a blanket or robe. The large cape-like sleeves are noticeable in several pictures and are prominent on the dress of the doll carried by one little Cheyenne girl. The large pendants of dentelium shells worn by spotted fawn and rain in the face's wives were common among the squaws and bright colored shells were particularly prized for such ornaments. In March 1870, I traveled from Mussel Shell to Fort Browning on Milk River, and for a distance of 40 miles, I do not think we were out of easy rifle shot of buffalo. We could see many miles on either side, but the eye only met herd after herd of grazing and slowly moving buffalo 
Three days later, I passed over the same trail on my return trip, and the vast herds had disappeared as if by magic. Only two or three old bulls were still wandering over the prairie. Taking pictures of buffalo was a task that required courage as well as patience. Huffman told on one occasion that some of the pictures were secured by hiding in a small washout with the wind right and waiting for the buffalo to graze by close enough to photograph. Unfortunately, it is not known how or where his splendid buffalo pictures were secured, but they must have been obtained at considerable risk of life and limb. Hide hunting was rough, dirty, and sometimes dangerous work, and the hunter was in the opinion of one old ex-cowboy, one tough hombre. Theodore Roosevelt, who saw them after the herds were gone, noted that they formed a distinct class and were absolutely shiftless and improvident had no settled habits, were injured to peril and hardship, but entirely unaccustomed to steady work, and that many drifted into criminal occupations. Killing buffalo at ranges of 200 to 600 yards required fine marksmanship, but many other factors also contributed to the end result. With factory loaded cartridges at 25 cents each and hides at a top of $3.50 each, the hunter had to reload his shells to keep expenses down. If he was to kill efficiently, he had to try for a kill at each shot. Just how many thousands of buffalo were killed is not known. In 1886, Hornaday tried to arrive at an approximate figure and failed. One account of these days in the Yellowstone Journal states that Custer County, which then comprised the entire southeastern corner of Montana, shipped 180,000 hides in 1882 which was about 75% of the kill in the Northwest. When it was all over, except for the little herd started by Walking Coyote in 1874 on the Flathead Reservation with two bull and two heifer calves, only a few scattered survivors remained alive. That was the end of the buffalo hunting. During the next few years, bone pickers scoured the plains and did their work so well that when Hornaday and Huffman went to Hell Creek on a hunting trip in 1901, even the bones had almost totally disappeared. The coming of the railroad pulled down the curtain on the picturesque days of the bull train and the stagecoach. However, the arrival of the track-laying crew of the Northern Pacific Railroad in Miles City in the fall of 1881 and of the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad in 1907 provided Huffman with some new and interesting subject material for photographs. Later, Huffman looked back at the years of 1879 1880 and 1881 and those he enjoyed most of all he believed that there was no more west after the coming of the railroad but his own pictures show that this was not strictly true particularly in remote areas today there is a vacant haunting atmosphere about the old west part of officers row still remains but the barracks stables and the old guardhouse are gone only in the pictures of their memory and the few old-timers see anything that reminds them of the blue uniform of the troopers and the beef-feathered warriors who have gone on their last scout. In 1893, Huffman was elected a member of the Montana House of Representatives from Custer County. Here, he introduced one of the first bills for irrigation in the state. And it's interesting to know that while he was interested in the development of the country, he watched certain aspects of that development with feelings of regret. There were probably other activities which brought more personal satisfaction than those conducted with public office. For example, he must have thoroughly enjoyed helping President Theodore Roosevelt in his program of establishing national forest. Another conservation activity which brought Huffman pleasure was the preservation of wildlife. The love of the wild things which he had as a youngster remained with him to the end. In December 1931, Huffman and his wife journeyed to Billings to spend the holiday season with their daughter Ruth. On the morning of the 29th, he went downtown to read and visit with friends at the Billings Commercial Club. As he climbed the steps from the street, he was stricken with a heart attack and died a few minutes later. Thus passed a pioneer who had watched with pride the development of a frontier country, but who had loved best those wild, free days he recorded with his camera. Although he left behind a priceless collection of frontier pictures, it is to be regretted that he never completed his book, Recollections of a Frontier Photographer.